waters of baptism. The cup of salvation. God's word for his people. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to all of you today. Uh, this is the first day of Daylight Savings Time, the second Sunday of Lent. Uh, we are glad to be together this morning and to be able to celebrate uh, the gift of God's grace in our midst uh, and to remember always the promise that we're two or more gathered in His name. He's there in the midst of us. Uh, so again, thank you and welcome. Thank you for being here and welcome to all of you.
Pharisees tried to stop Jesus, Jesus said, I will keep on. I will keep on healing. I will keep on teaching. I will keep on preaching. I will keep on flipping the tables of injustice. I will keep on treating every person like a child of God. I will keep on believing that this world can change. I will keep on and keep on and keep on until God's promised day. Forgive us, God, for the times when we stop. Amen. Family of faith, because Jesus' love just keeps going, we can trust that that love and grace exists for us. So rest in this good news. No matter what we do wrong or what we leave undone, we are under God's wings. We are loved, held, and forgiven. Thanks be to God for a love like this. Amen. Let us take the time to greet one another and share the peace of Christ with our neighbor. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. children come up if they want to. Good morning. Good morning to you. Now, I know that uh, you're getting used to the idea that when you come up here, I usually have something in my hand to show you. But today, Bible reading is a very unusual one, and it talks about chickens, right? You know about chickens? It'd be kind of hard for me to bring a chicken in today. Number one, I don't have any pet chickens, and number two, I think they would make a lot of noise and make a lot of fuss to have the chicken in house. <laughs> have you been around much chickens? Any chickens? No? No, not really either. Well, we know that, we know that eggs come from a chicken. Right? They come from the hen, which is what we're going to hear about today. The hen, uh, the, 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 they, make, they lay eggs. And uh, also that from those eggs, baby chickens come. Right? Little baby, we call them chicks. Today we're hearing about how a hen takes his, their wings and they will cover the chicks, the baby chicks, in bad weather. Right? Now, I've never seen that. But I've seen pictures of it, and I guess it's got to be true, right? Can you imagine wings covering the baby chicks? Well, if we can't imagine that, what we can imagine is mom or dad putting their arms around us in a storm and maybe spreading their jacket over us to keep us from getting wet, or a warmer jacket to keep us warm, right? We can remember, we can imagine that. And what Jesus is trying to tell us is that that's what Jesus' love is like. It's like that warm blanket. It's like the wings of a hen covering their chicks. 
it's like the arms and arms of mom and dad as they surround us with their love and give us hugs. It's good to know that Jesus loves us that much, right? Jesus loves us that much. And so I, I want to leave you with that and to think about how much we are loved by this Jesus. Like a hen covers her chicks, like mom and dad covers us with their arms. Amen? Amen. To that? Amen means we, we agree and we're done. Right? Okay? Amen. Amen. Scripture this morning is from Genesis 15, 1 through 12, 17 and 18, and Philippians 3, 17 through 21. First Genesis. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, and your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these and cut them in two, laying each half over the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. And now from Philippians. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live accordingly to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction, their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of His glory, by the power that also enables Him to make all things subject to Himself. Our Gospel reading is from the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, meaning Jesus, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox for me, listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. 
How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you are now willing. See, your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Where does the time go? Right? Time literally seems to fly away. Uh, we measure our early days in uh, going through school by the grades that we are attending and we're able to measure them out in that, that way and then we are young and, uh, and carefree and single and the time seems, doesn't seem to matter at all. It goes from one party to the next. And, uh, and then we have children and then we start to measure our time according to their milestones. And then uh, the children are gone and then we start counting the days to retirement. And then you're in retirement and you're back in the days again when you're in your 20s where it's one party after another. <laughs> or I should say, one doctor's appointment after another. Right? Uh, all of our trips down to Boulder uh, from my wife and I seem to uh, center around a doctor or some other kind of, a, kind of an appointment. Right? Time is a, is a funny thing. Uh, we, uh, I, I was reminded of the old Simon and Garfunkel song as I was thinking about the sermon this week. Time it was and what a time it was. A time of innocence, a time of confidences. Right? 1968, that was written. My goodness, how, how time flies. We tend to think of time in, in, uh, in linear terms. You know, the thing we measure and mark it out. You know, in classical physics, a, a, a simple definition of time is that which the clock measures. That's time. Uh, and uh, we, it's used, but we also know that time is not, and we, that, that's the way we understand time is linear, past, present, and future. We can't get back times that are past. We can only remember them. But, uh, you know, uh, and I, please, I welcome any discussion about this because I'm not an expert, but relativity and quantum uh, physics has a different understanding of time and that is much more fluid. Right? In fact, they say that at the edge, they can me they, they've been able to measure that at the edge of black holes, time gets distorted. It's not as simple as seconds and milliseconds. Time gets distorted. And those of us who are fans of speculative fiction, uh, wait for the day when we can actually enter into warp speed, you know, where time gets folded, time and space gets folded, and you can just zip right through it. Right? past, present, and future, and sometimes time in the past is frozen for us uh, in, in little vignettes of, of memory. Jesus, uh, when Jesus comes onto the scene and when Jesus speaks of time, uh, he's, he's, he's introducing a different kind of a philosophical concept, a theological construct, and it's the idea of a right time, that there is a right time, a time when the purpose and will of God will be accomplished for all of, all of creation uh, and all of its concerns and worries about time and place and, and, and property and, and all the things that go along with how the, 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 our experience of day-to-day -day, day -day life, the right time, uh, a time for the accomplishment of God's purpose uh, in the world. Uh, we... Uh, are measuring that time right now during the season of Lent. And so we're jumping around a little bit in the Gospels. Uh, we've now jumped further into Jesus' ministry. Of all the things that we've heard over the last six weeks, and we've jumped over that again now. See, we're bending time. And now we are getting closer to uh, each, each week. We're getting closer to his entry into Jerusalem and his uh, suffering and death and resurrection. So we're called this. We were we 
another way of ordering time, right, during Lent. The story, in the story, Jesus, we've jumped ahead, and Jesus is continuing and has continued to do his thing in the world. And that thing is to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to preach good news to the poor and the oppressed, to gather uh, God's people together, and to continue to proclaim this good news as the fulfillment of God's purpose at the right time. And it's all wrapped up, this right time is wrapped up in his person, right, in his person. So Jesus is doing his thing when this warning comes out of the blue from people that are typically uh, seen as the enemies of Jesus, the Pharisees, the religious authorities, who have a lot to lose uh, by what Jesus is talking about, because what he's talking about implies that uh, their uh, place in society and culture, their sort of place of privilege as part of the religious authority and established authority is, is being threatened by Jesus. He's doing all of these things, preaching the good news, talking about the coming of, the, of God's sal salvation, uh, healing the sick and, and casting out demons. He's not doing it in the temple. Right? He's not doing it where the authority is, right? And so, but these people would normally be seen as his enemies, but they come to him with a warning of an even greater enemy, and that is Herod, uh, Herod and his plan to kill them. They somehow or another have uh, some, an inside track on Herod's plans. Herod is the heir to the Herod who was king at the time of Jesus' birth, and now this is his son or grandson, and uh, so, and has the same name, uh, and, uh, but it, he seems to be following in his, uh, in his forebear's footsteps, and that uh, this idea of Jesus coming in not only threatens the religious authorities, but the secular authorities also, the king, uh, the king, the kingship of Herod. And uh, when we hear of this warning uh, to Jesus from Herod, it uh, puts us in mind of, of the time that is to come in Jesus' life, because we know what's going to happen, right? And in fact, because we know what's going to happen, time literally does get con convoluted and convulsed, and there's sort of a, uh, a, a wavering in the space-time continuum here, because we know that Herod will follow through on this threat and lead Jesus in front of the even greater authorities of the Romans, uh, where he will be judged and, uh, and executed. Time gets convoluted and convulsed because this threat, we know this threat to Jesus is actually going to happen. And, uh, and uh, there's probably a part of us that when we hear this, wish that Jesus would uh, follow this good advice, you know, and get, get out of town, and get away from, from this threat. But Jesus is operating in that concept of right time, right? Of accomplishing what it is that God has proposed and purposed for him. And he knows, Jesus knows what's going to happen also. He knows it when he hears it and before he hears it. And uh, this threat, he knows that this threat to him is a part of accomplishing God's purpose. This is the right time. Right? This is Jesus' time. Uh, and that uh, the violence that is threatened against him and the death, the horrible death that he will suffer is uh, more or less necessitated by what it means to be living amongst human beings. Right? Violence is a part of the human experience. We are seeing it every day on the TV. It's not the first time we've seen it, is it? Uh, you live long enough and uh, you have enough experiences and you continue to be amazed not only by the goodness of human beings and how they respond to the violence that's in the world, but just how violent we can be and what it brings up in us when we, uh, when we watch the news uh, in uh, what's happening in Ukraine. You know, it's in our nature to be, uh, to be filled with Compassion when we see the, the pictures of, of children and women who are being turned into refugees. And at the same time, maybe, maybe it's just me. And that is, man, the anger that you feel 
that I feel. You know, the anger and the, and the, and the seeming rightness of the response to want to sort of get out my hunting rifle and whatever gear I have and buy the first, buy a ticket and go to the Ukraine. Here I am, an almost 69 year old guy that would have trouble, uh, has trouble sometimes when I get up out of bed getting my back straightened yeah. out. But it's, uh, you know, it's a part of who we are and Jesus recognizes that and his coming <coughs> and his purpose and what has been purposed for him by God is about the right time of entering into that violence and transforming it. Through his, the violence that is going to be perpetrated upon him is the hope that all violence, as it is, he is crucified, can be crucified with him and that it not ever be necessary again that for each of us individually, none of us needs to suffer any violence, certainly at the hand of a merciful God who offers his own son, who offers his own son at the right time. Christ, as we heard in this here in the scriptures, Christ died for the ungodly, for the violent, for those, for the angry, for the sullen, for, the, for, the, for all of us. The necessity of what it means to be a human being is the necessity, exactly the necessity of why Jesus says, I'm going to keep on doing what I'm doing, right? To the very end, for our sake and for the sake of all of the violence in the world, to crucify it and to transform it and to raise it again on the third day. He hears it and he reminds us that he has a different way of seeing time both in his time, 2,000 years ago, and even as we hear it today, because we are still waiting. We're still waiting for that transformation to happen. We see it day by day in little small things, but we know that even as he has already accomplished in his own time this wonderful transformative uh, act of self-giving, we are still waiting for it to be accomplished in the greater world around us, and please God, please God, for it to be accomplished in me. Right? For it to be accomplished in me. The greater work of transforming the violence in this world to give us the hope of that better world on a day-to-day -day -day basis, this greater work for Jesus, when we think about what Jesus says here, I've got to do this today and tomorrow and on the third day. It'll be accomplished. It reminds us of the third day when he rises again. But he's talking about the daily work that he has right now. This great work that he is doing, accomplishing God's purpose, is done in the midst of the little acts of daily work. His acts of daily work of curing the sick, healing the, the lame, uh, you know, casting out demons, preaching good news. That's his daily work, and he keeps doing it. He has a, Jesus has a passion for that work, and it's driven by compassion, right? And we hear it in that wonderful little vignette. How many times would I have liked to have gathered my children as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings? As I share with the kids, I've never seen that. But there's wonderful pictures all over the internet of it, and it's just like amazing. The, and there's this hen sitting there with all these little chicks underneath, underneath the wings. The compassion that is pictured here of, of this Jesus accomplishing this great work of God in his daily work, driven, his passion driven by and solely driven by his compassion for this world, for this violent, broken, world continues to say, These, this is the world, these are the people that I want to gather under my wings. The same people, the same chicks and children of God that will say, crucify, 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 or I don't know him, I don't know him, I don't know him. Right? Still, 
driven by that compassion, in spite of our resistance, because he says, I know that even as I desire to gather you, you will not. Right? You will not. It will be accomplished. It will be accomplished. And it will be accomplished, and he reminds us, and the story again reminds us of what is to come, when he says, you won't even see me, and it doesn't mean that literally, but recognize me again, until you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And when do we hear that? On Palm Sunday, when he enters into Jerusalem, and they say, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. So our story of our, of our hope for transformation as we intersect with this story of Jesus this morning is to, re, is to recognize and to acknowledge our continuing resistance. It's just as hard for us to accept transformation uh, of our daily lives as it was for the people who were following Jesus then, just as hard as it was for the Pharisees, just as hard as it was for the crowd who said, crucify, just as hard as it was for Peter to sit and said, I know him not. But he continues to promise that kind of transformation. So what is our right time, the right time for this to happen, look like to us? And the key is in understanding Jesus doing this great work in all the little things that he was doing. You and I are allowing and helping to accomplish the great work of forwarding God's purpose in the world through Jesus Christ, not through our mighty preaching or our mighty teaching or our mighty example, but just as Jesus did day by day by day. Today, tomorrow, the third day, it will be accomplished in us. In little, the little work, the, the daily work of our lives, which includes our daily repentance of the violence that is in our hearts, our daily looking again and listening again to this message coming on a Sunday and hearing the scriptures uh, proclaimed. And we are taught, we find ourselves tied to the story of Jesus, tied to the story of Jesus, and trusting in the midst of our resistance, trusting and claiming that he is the one who accomplishes all, in all time, in the right time, in the face of all resistance, in the right time, and for the sake of all who he would gather as a hen gathers under his wings. For the sake of all, he continues to drive forward with his great work. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>
the ushers come forward? gifts to you, holy God, may we remember those who are forgotten by us too many times, the hungry, the lonely, the homeless, the vulnerable, yet are important citizens in your kingdom of grace, justice, and hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Praise God for that is guided by and informed by compassion for one another. We, we, are, we also we want to lift before you the congregations and churches of the different nations that are involved in this uh, terrible struggle that's happening in Ukraine for the Orthodox churches, for the Ukrainian Catholic Church, for all the Catholic churches in Europe, and for the evangelical churches of the neighboring communities, the neighboring countries around, around the Ukraine who are reaching out uh, with this, the kind of care that we would hope that we would re be able to reach out with in love. God of mercy, hear our prayers. prayers. We pray for the world around us. Lord, we know that your desire is to, is to crucify violence and transform it through your resurrection into a great and abiding love for this world. We pray that uh, you would continue to guide us in our own responses to the violence in this world and to warfare. 
We pray that you would be with those who make, administer, and judge laws, that they would do so righteously, both here in our nation and in the nations who are involved in strife, wherever they may be. We pray for the governments of Russia, and we pray for the government of Ukraine, for its leaders, that they would be led towards peace. God of mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for our community, for the town of Nederland, and for all those surrounding us. May we be, as a city set upon a hill, a light and a beacon to the world around us. Help us to be small, uh, help us in a, some small way and a daily way to be torchbearers of that light in this, in this community. We pray for all those who are uh, struggling or suffering in our community and pray that you would use us as instruments of your love, care, and peace. God of mercy, hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. We pray for all those who are, uh, who are struggling, either physically, mentally, or emotionally or spiritually. We pray for those who are ill or in the hospital. We pray for a quick recovery from surgery for Al Nelson and for Grace during his health care journey. And we lift up before you in this moment of quiet, either out aloud or in our hearts, all the other concerns we may have for, uh, for people whom we love. For me, Conkey and Cancer Treatment. God be with Jim Stevens, with Harris Glow, with Bob Payne, with Jane Bloom's sister, with all those others who are battling cancer. God of mercy, hear our prayers. Let us pray for the church triumphant, for all those who have come and gone before us, who have lived their times on this earth, and have celebrated the way in which the right time has happened for them each and every day. We pray for those who remember. We pray for those who we do not do not know. We pray for all those who are, uh, all, all, the, all of those uh, casualties of war that we are seeing on, uh, and hearing about on television. Help us to be ever mindful of your great kingdom which is to come, when all will be revealed to us and all questions of time and rightness will be resolved. God of mercy. Hear our prayers. All these things and whatever else we know, you know in our hearts, O Lord, we ask in the name of and for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And do not let us fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our ending here is uh, number 422 in our Presbyterian hymnal, God Who's Giving Knows No Ending.
Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.